Good night, good night. So, I'm just waiting for a few more people to come in. I see Apostle Hobrian and Sister Andrea Bless you. Let me just invite a few people in. I uh, just want to come in and pretty much just uh, say conclude the discussion we had. We started yesterday. Bless you, Apostle. I hope you guys can hear me. I'm trying to keep it down because my daughter is sleeping, but I'm, I'm not going to be here with you guys long. But I promised yesterday that I um, that I would complete, I would come back and give a report after the studies last night, after we went through the teaching last night. Bless you, Sister Andrea. Good night, good night. <laughs> so we will see exactly. Um, let's go in and let us see exactly how it goes. Let me invite a few people in. <laughs> I'm here inviting a few people myself. So as I said, it won't be long. It won't be for long. I just wanted to come in and to do this because uh, there is a lot that I think, or should I say, I know we need to talk about. But when last night I was actually, um, last night we were talking about just spirituality. Going in and trying to actually understand like we actually there was a point that was brought out where i was saying that because it is spiritual doesn't mean it's godly and uh we went in and we did it we did pretty much a study and the study that we did was not just a discussion but we went in and we look at some operation of uh some well-known people some of the things that they had to say that really would shock you if you would just stop and pay attention and I'm here and I went out and as I was driving in just now, it's like the Holy Spirit was he's, he's talking to me. And he's just reminding me just how fragile life really is. That we get opportunities and we kind of take them for granted. We kind of like expect that things are just going to automatically work out and things are just going to fall in place. But... I don't know about you, but it kind of, kind of it concerns me. And my major concern is how can we be in a position, how, how could you be okay with just pretending to be real? Or, or could I be okay with just pretending to be real? Or could anyone be okay with just pretending to know God? And I'm like, I really want to have this discussion. I stopped and I thought about it. And I've realized that people are willing to go to absolutely any length for power. Not necessarily for God. They don't really want God. As a deliverance minister, that's something that I experience all the time. And I've realized over the, oh, since I've been doing it, not to take it personal. I try not to, but sometimes I do. I'm not going to lie about it. Because I've realized that people will come in with sicknesses and diseases of every description. And they are desperate for you to lay hands on them or to speak over their lives so they can be healed and they can be delivered, but they have absolutely no interest in the God that you serve. And you could actually, you could tell them until the cows come home that you have no power of your own. You could tell them until they break that, guess what? No man can take the credit for this. God is the one that is doing it, but for some reason, people are not interested in God. They just want to be healed. They just want deliverance. They just want money. They just want property. They just want possession. And I was there, and as I was driving in, looking in, and I saw a post on Facebook, and I saw um, a young man, just a few years older than me, than I am, few years older than I am and um, it was like bless you Prophet Cassandra and I saw it said SIP or RIP rest in peace and I was like man life is so fragile bless you sister Eva life is so fragile and then what really gets me is that you don't get a chance there's no reset there is no do-overs 
I'm hoping someone is listening to me. No resets, no do-overs. This is it. What you do with the opportunity you're given now determines your eternity. This is it. This is it. No do-overs. And I was there, and I must admit, as much as I was there and I was kind of feeling sad on behalf of the, the person that passed on, I was there and I was thinking to myself, God Almighty, I don't even deserve. I, 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 there was, it's like a mystery I was asking God. Bless you, Sister Angela. Welcome. It's like a mystery. I was asking the Lord, what did I do to deserve to be alive right now? I don't know if anyone else uh, has asked themselves this question. What did I do to deserve to be alive right now? And to be honest, when I stopped and I thought about it, I'm like, nothing. I have nothing to do with the fact that I'm alive. I have nothing to do with the fact that I'm saved. I have nothing to do with the fact that my story did not end as others did. And then as I was looking at what took place in terms of this young man that is, is dead, I thought to myself, you know what? Then death is something that cannot be uh, avoided. We will all die. So dying is not the problem. Because that's what I thought about. So we're sad and we're saying condolences and all this, but we will all die. It's not something that we want to talk about. It's a topic that people might want to avoid, but death is inevitable. We will all die. There's one thing that is sure. But then I realized that if we actually live this life well, we have absolutely nothing to worry about because guess what? We have a God that will make sure that our future is bright. Right? Our future will be bright on this side of the fence, on the other side of the fence. But then, at least I'm still talking about spirituality. But I wanted to give like a somber talk to some of the family members and ask viewers that are live now and that are coming in or that will be watching the replay like have you really stopped have you given any thought to your eternity have you really thought see sometimes we're here and people are busy um people are busy investing in a pension people are busy investing in so many different things preparing for the future but for the long for the whole world what should I say? For eternity then. That's the best word. For that walk that we cannot turn back from, for some reason, many are not actually making anything. They're not putting anything away. No investment. People are just busy living. People are busy just enjoying life. Only if you care about what is taking place. And as sad as it's own, I'm not talking about just in the world. Talking about even in the church, many don't really care about actually having this deep-rooted relationship with God. There's something that I've stopped and I thought about when I was actually coming into Christianity. This is it. I thought, I don't want to play no games. If this is it and it's only a game, then I'd rather just not be a Christian. That's me personally. If it's just a form of godliness and putting on a show so we can impress the world, then I think it's a waste. I think I'm waking my daughter up too. But I just want to say, that can't be it. That can't be it. There must be more to it than this. There must be more to it than this. Last night we went in and we actually... Uh, went over a study talking about spirituality talking about what is actually uh, authentic and what's not authentic what is godly and what is not godly we paid attention as we saw people from the Hindu religion as they were going in and they were showing you how to open your third eye how to see spiritual things we saw people who were blindfolded and they could read things and see things and pretty much uh, these people are doing things the way they're doing it 
the only thing that's missing is the name of Jesus because if they say in Jesus name a whole bunch of people would have been deceived by it except these people did not say in Jesus name they were actually giving glory to their God their Hindu God fast forward like maybe an hour later we paid attention and we saw as men of God renowned prophets we're also talking about activating this third high going in and I'm like so I don't get it so you're depending on yourself to do something that is the job of the Holy Spirit and then I started thinking about it and I was like but there is no fear no one cares Why is it that no one is afraid? That's my question. Why are we not afraid as Christians, as men and women of God? Why are we not afraid? Why are we not concerned? I want to talk to Christians, but I also want to talk to those who are actually, today is Friday night, so it's, it's Friday. It's Friday night here in Jamaica and in quite a few different places around the world. People are busy having fun. There's going to be a whole lot of activity taking place tonight and tomorrow night. There's people there, the last thing on their mind right now is Jesus. There's people there, they're just busy living their lives. God has not crossed their mind, nor will he cross their mind, except they find themselves with their backs against the wall. And as I was there thinking about that, I must admit, I, I kind of felt guilty thinking about it. And my guilt is this, I was there and I was like, man, there was a time when that was me. There was a time when I was not busy thinking about God either. I was conscious that there was a God, but I did nothing to explore knowing him. So then I stopped and I thought, what, what stopped? why is it that I did not die in my sin? I thank God. I'm excited that I am saved, but I'm there and I'm like, man, I see people dying in their sin. I see people destined for hell and I'm like, whoa, that could have been me. Anyone understand what I'm talking about? In my head, that could have been me. And if we're being transparent, then I have made more mistakes than some of these guys. It's almost like a David and Saul situation, eh? Anyone get what I'm saying? If you understand what I'm saying, just type yes. There you go, woman of God, and we're keeping it transparent. There you go. I'm thinking, man, was this guy doing anything worse than I was doing? That's my personal question. And in the process of feeling sad on behalf of this person, on his family, I'm just grateful that God did not allow me to die in my in my past situation. He did not allow me to perish. Good night, Sister Florence. Uh, we have Sister Florence. We have Mr. Clark. Bless you, sir. Sir Fisher. Bless you. And it's not something to be all hyped up and excited about. I know it's one of those, one of these lives that someone might, but I want you to think. I want those who are, are not chosen Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, just in case. And those who are skeptic and those who are actually like, there is no, Jesus is not real and Jesus is this and Jesus is that. And I just want to ask you a question. And I know for a fact that he is real, but I want to use the scenario of what if, what if? What if you turn your back on God and Jesus is real? What if there is actually a heaven and a hell? What if there is an eternal damnation or an eternity with God? What if? What if your actions now are actually counted for you or against you? What if? What if this, what if what we thought was just folk stale and made up? What if God is real? What if Jesus Christ is real and what if he really died on the cross for us? Are you willing to take 
such a chance are you willing to go through this and to actually and i know you might not want to hear this you might be getting ready to have some fun you might have some some plans but just what if and i must say i'm privileged i'm privileged because I was not treated the way I deserved to be treated. And I thank God for it. And I'm hoping that someone else here can actually testify and say the same. That I was not treated the way I was, I deserved to be treated. Mm -hmm. And if that is the reality. That God did not treat you based on the way you deserve to be treated. Then my question is. Are you willing to explore? To just see if there's actually a God. And I use the word or the term again, what if? What if there's actually a God? Or what if there's actually a judgment? And what if he's coming back to repay every man according to his or her deed? What if? What if you're busy going to church and you're just concerned about spirituality but you don't want God? What if? What if you'll allow nigromancy to speak over your life? Because you just want the blessing, but you don't want the blesser. Because you want to be successful, but you don't want light. What if? What if Jesus Christ is real? What if this is not just speech? What are you going to do if this is real? Because I stop and I think about it and I'm like, man, I don't understand. People are literally willing to throw their lives away. Literally willing. What if? This is not an exciting scope. I'm not here to prophesy to you. I'm not here to get you excited. I just want to get you focused. What if what you're doing is not good enough? What if? Is there anyone here that is actually willing to do whatever it takes to get this right? Because I can tell you this, my life was not always like this. There was a time when, and that's, this is the thing. So, God has given me a genuine concern and love for people. Meaning, I know that I don't deserve the opportunity I've been given. I know this. I know that I've not been treated the way I should have been treated. I know this. I'm also fully conscious that there's people that have done less and have paid way more. I know this. So now let me ask you, listening or anyone that's coming back on the replay, are you conscious of it? Do you know you don't deserve this life that you have? Do you know that you've not been treated based on your actions? And if so, what do you plan to do about it? Do you have absolutely any intention at all to get your life in order, to get your life on track. Just wondering. There you go, Sister Angela. I am willing to do whatever it takes also. We have seen a demonstration where men and women of God are willing to, 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 to sell themselves, to replace the sweet Holy Spirit with nigromancy, all in a bid to be famous and to be wealthy. I don't understand it, but it makes me conscious, it makes me somber, and I ask the God that thunders in the heaven that I will never get to that stage. Never. I understand. People are not really looking for a conscious thought. There was a time, as a matter of fact, if I can share this live, I remember I've mentored a lot of people. From, a lot, from around the world. I've met with people who are now mentoring. I've seen a lot of hypocrisy. I've seen a lot of games. Just keeping it real. And I remember asking the Lord, I don't get it. So you'd come in and, not, I'm not just talking about myself, but I'm talking about others too. And you come in and you have something sincere. You have something genuine from the heart, from the spirit that you would like to put out. And you may get maybe like, pretty much eight people like we have right now. A few people have come in and out, but I'm just gonna use an example scenario. So we have a few people, eight or nine people. And in the process of having that eight or nine people, you will watch and I'm 
and, and I'm giving you a real life situation that took place. You will watch and see someone come in that is utterly playing. Utterly playing. They know a God, but they don't know the God. And you will watch as people flood towards towards what they're doing. So I don't know if this is only me, but I was like, I spoke to my God about it. I was talking to him and I was like, I don't understand it. It's almost an insult to what you've invested in us. And I'm not talking about just myself. I'm talking about those men and women of God that's really living for God. And the Lord said something to me. Do not be discouraged. He said, unfortunately, the people are not used to truth. And someone might be offended by me saying it, but it's the truth. People want to hear that you're getting a new car, that you're coming out. Nobody want to hear that their life is a mess. Nobody want to hear that they need to live righteous and holy. Nobody want to hear that they need to turn their lives around. And then it kind of perplexes me because my question is, what are you going to do with a car when you're dead? How is a car going to help you if you're on your way to hell? And how is a new house going to help you if you're on your way to hell? And then it reminds me of the scripture and it says, I wish that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. That means, yes, a car is important and a house is important and your finances are important, but your number one priority should, should be your soul. And when was the last time you did a, a soul check? So I want to ask, when was the last time you did a soul check? When was the last time you checked and see if your soul was prospering? When was the last time you checked? To make sure that you weren't trying to prosper financially and economically or whatever you're trying to prosper as without actually first making sure that your soul is actually in prosperity it's a sad situation i know for a fact that most people don't really want to have this conversation i get it I know it's Friday night and you have better things to do. You'd, you'd rather go out and have some fun. Who wants to talk about the reality of your soul? Your soul can wait until later. Right now, you just want to have some fun. Right now, you might just want to go out and have a drink. You might just want to have some fun. Go out. Maybe go out and get hooked up with someone who you're in a relationship with. Or maybe just sleep with someone random. Maybe you just want to get yourself drunk and get uh, get the cares of life off your mind but have you stopped and think just in case there is actually a God what are you actually doing and this is not a condemnation as I said because truthfully I, I said I'm blessed because rewind a few years ago when I was most people who were going just doing their own thing so I'm not coming from a place of judgment nor am I coming from a place of condemnation. It's more from a place of concern. And if you're a Christian, then I'm coming from a place of concern that you might actually be in the church, but do you actually know the God of the church? Very important. Very important. Very, very important. So I never knew how I was I came into your mentorship and you bless you great woman of God and I've learned a lot myself you guys have helped me to grow you guys have helped me to be stable in God you guys have helped my relationship to be deeper with God and I'm just excited about it good night sir Oscar it's not exciting if I start speaking in tongues right now if I start prophesying right now, as a matter of fact, if I start speaking about healing and deliverance and you're coming out, we'll have people coming in. I understand it. Human beings, humanity doesn't like to face the reality. Good night, Sister Dora. We don't like the reality. We are superficial. Let's not have the, let's not have the tough conversations. Let's not focus on it. Let's just, just focus on living. And in doing so, it's like we're living in the matrix because we're missing out on the reality of what is taking place and we're not seeing that we're setting up absolutely no foundation for the future and i don't just mean your future here and earth, but your eternity your long-term future i don't know 
I can't be the only one that's concerned. I'm hoping I'm not the only one that's concerned. I'm hoping so. And I get it. I get it. You're young. Or you might not be so young. You just want to enjoy your life. And you don't want to be controlled by anything or anyone. But just what if there's actually a God? What if? Because I must admit now that I'm young too. And the attractions, the attractions of the life outside, and let's be honest, it can be attractive. The things that appeal to your senses. But you see, I'm in a position. Okay, good question. I'm in a position where my what if is no longer a what if. So I've said, what if God is real? And what if there's a judgment? And what if there's hell? And what if there's heaven? But I want you to come and you, I want you to know this. I'm coming to you, Sir Clark, and also Sir Ascal. I'll read this in a second. I want you to come. I don't want to see what if. Because some of us don't have the luxury of what if. So some of us, our speech have to change from what if God is real to I know God is real so I need to do this. And what if hell is real and I know hell is real so now I got to live a certain life. And what if heaven is real and I know heaven is real so I got to live this life. Sir, how do I check my soul? I'm not sure what you're asking me if you mean how do you check if your soul is in right standing with God. I'm assuming that's what you're asking. If that's what you're asking, sir, say yes or no, and I will continue answering. Sir Oscar said it might sound savage, but it is it's what it is. That's where our focus should be. We know the journey is not easy, but we can do it one hundred percent these days. As people don't even care about uh, care about integrity to be honest integrity <laughs> have been sacrificed a long time ago but the secret is all of us have an inner man that speaks to us there is none that will be standing before God in a judgment innocent there is none that can say that I didn't know come on we all know as a matter of fact I'm sure everyone in this room knows when they're doing something right or when they're doing something wrong. In Christianity or outside of Christianity, I know this for a fact. For a fact. Now let me see if I can see what Mr. Clark is asking and I'm hoping that you will actually let me know if what I said. Okay, yes. So how do you know if your soul, how do you know if your soul is actually um, how do you check your soul? How do you check if your soul is in good standing with God? Well, this is a fact. For you to know if your soul is in good standing with God, you must have a relationship with God. It can't just be about going to church. The unfortunate truth is, many people use church, just going to church, speaking in tongues, paying tithes and offering to determine if they are living a godly life. It's way deeper than that. So can I be honest, there are people that are going to church that will be going to hell. Sad, but it's true. There are people going to church, speaking in tongues, that will be going to hell. There are people that tithe and pay offering. They might pay a lot of tithes and offering, and they're going to hell. Because your tithe can't save you. And speaking in tongues can't save you. And going to church can't save you. Paul spoke about love. It says, though I speak in tongues of man and of angel, but if you have no love, if you don't have God, because God is love, right? It profits you nothing. And though you give your body to be burned, if you don't have God, it profits you nothing. It means, I'm trying to get people to get away from the superficial to get into the relational, the relationship. How do you go from the point where you just you go to church, you pay your tent, your, your one tent or whatever you pay. You're a good tithe, a good offering. You sing, you clap, you shout. As far as you're concerned, you're a good Christian. Except, 
You don't even know the God that you're serving. Do you know how many Christians that Jesus is a phantom to them? God is a phantom to them. They genuinely don't know this God. And I don't know how anyone actually can spend their time being faithful to a God they don't know. And there you go, sir, Oscar. Indeed, we're not sitting against each other. We're sitting against God. And that's the truth. But sometimes I've also heard the term, only God can judge me. There is a judgment. There is speculation. And then there is facts. The judgment says that God is going to, you're going to stand before him. And if we're found wanting, then hell is our portion. Then you have what people call speculation, which people call judgment also. And they're like, oh, you're judging me. Then you have facts, where I'm like, okay, so I saw you doing this, so it's not a speculation. I'm not judging you based on what we call judge. So therefore, it's one of the things where I just recommend that we actually go in and get it right with God. Because ultimately, it's like, all right, I think I've spoken this before. But I remember when I got saved and I was struggling with the process of being fully converted. I'm not trying to maintain my past character, persona, while trying to be a Christian. And I was at church in London and um, about four of the guys, yeah, four guys came that I knew before. And they were kind of checking. And I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but they were like, sometimes people make, it, make you feel as if Making this step towards Christianity is not the best step you have ever made. So they called me soldier because I'm, I'm ex-military and I was like, soldier, a soldier, I heard you became a Christian. But the way it was said, it was almost like I was letting myself down and others to be a Christian. I was so busy trying to fit in that I was like, okay, I should have just accepted I was a Christian, but I was busy trying to fit in. And they were laughing and I remember one of the guys said, I told you he wasn't no Christian as if there's something wrong with being a Christian. I'm showing you how perverted the devil is. And I'm not talking about these men because they're cool guys, but I'm talking about how the devil can manipulate us and, and cause us to celebrate darkness and repel light. And he was like, yeah, I told you he wasn't no Christian. And I was there smirking like an idiot, knowing full well that I had accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, but I was trying to fit in. And a reputation to uphold. And then the Holy Spirit said something to me. He gave me a parable. He said, Five blind guys are walking. And one went and got his sights corrected. But so he can fit in with the guys who are genuinely blind, he pretends to be blind also. And I could hear the God that thunders the heaven speaking to me so clearly, reprimanding me because he was saying, these guys are still blind. They don't know me. But what's your excuse? Because you know me. So I want to ask some of you guys who have experienced Jesus Christ. What's your excuse? What you see when people say you're fun, you had fun and did ungodly. No, since you say if you want to stop our fun and change. No, let them know. That if you were all walking in a minefield, and because you were lucky not to be blown up and lose limbs, don't mean that you should actually keep walking in it. And only someone who is evil would actually wake up, realize that the world they were walking was a minefield, and not inform his or her colleagues, friends, and families about it. Because ultimately, because you made it out, don't mean someone else says, How many people do you know? that have gone in and many of us have been lucky I should I know not lucky but been blessed where well, we've gone in and we have put our lives on the line sexually and everything but we are lucky not to be HIV positive not to walk around do you know you have people who have actually gone in and engaged in a sexual act once without protection HIV and there's people who have done it multiple times and they were blessed or lucky enough not to actually 
contract it, contact, come in contact with it. So if someone was telling people don't sleep around, would you see because one person went in and they actually, because of your life prior, and they did not actually get sick, that the person who might be doing it for the first time couldn't be sick. And that's the, and that's the thing about it. It's a gamble. It's like a Russian roulette. It's like Russian roulette. People are assuming that because one person didn't die in their sin, someone else won't. Look around. There's more people dying in sin than those who are not. So this is what I would say a possible. Only a cruel, cruel person, an evil person, that has walked a walk, that now sees it's a minefield and does not warn the village about it. Any sensible, God-fearing man or woman would go out and they would actually tell the village, the town, the city, the county, wherever. They would do it. So therefore, because you had the experience, because we made, because we sinned and we didn't get away with it, as a matter of fact, if most of us want to be honest, we did not get away with it, right? We didn't. Bless you, Sister Rosemary. So therefore, I would say, tell them. It's a minefield. Don't wait until you've lost a limb. To, to, for you to know it's a mind fear. Trust someone who has walked it and who have seen people who have lost limbs. It's a mind fear. And if you listen that it's a mind fear, then it would make your life easier. They might listen, they might not listen. It wouldn't make what you're saying any less truthful. And that's the secret about it. It is a mind fear. Every time we step out of the will of God, we're taking a chance and we can be redeemed. He is the redeemer. But there's no guarantee that we will be redeemed on this side of the fence. There are guys who have stepped out for half a day and they, 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 never, they never had a chance to make it back in. So we're trying to live our lives based on the statistic where there is no way, there's no way to accurately take these stats. Because my life is not your life and your life is not my life. The grace that you might have to get through certain things might not be the same grace I have. So therefore, this is an individual thing. Let every man, meaning men and women, work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. So I would say, everyone listening, based on what Apostle Obi have asked me, don't go in and wait until it's too late. Because you might try and jump off the Titanic when it's about to sink, but God Almighty, when it hit that iceberg, there's nowhere for you to jump anyway. Just saying. As iron sharpens iron, so shall we sharpen one another. Amen. 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 And, when, and that's brilliant, sir. When we choose to be sharpened, it makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. There's a secret that I've been teaching. You can't give what you don't have. So we could have the best of intentions, but if you don't know this God, it's a waste of time. Okay, before we move on, is there any more questions? Is there any is there anything that anyone would like to share? Because we, I would love to see what you have to share. Also, if you're here, share this video. Invite a few people in to come and join us. I have to, I have to watch on the replay. Amen. Amen. All right, anyone? Anyone? Questions, questions. Statements, statements. If there's anyone that has any question or any statement, let's go for it. Any questions? 
giving you like a minute to actually type one. I'm not going to be here much longer, by the way. It's now after 10. I'm going to shut it down. When I spoke about spirituality, we were going to go in and we were going to talk about something deep. And then I thought, man, we can be focusing on spirituality. But I realized that many people, bless you, Sister Rita, bless you, Sister Rosemary, we're just not giving the thought to it that we should, which is sad. Very, very sad. Okay. Any questions? If not, I'm about to be out of here. And I know this one is not one of these one of the most exciting topics to talk about. I know this. But I would be doing you a disservice to know the truth and not share it. Why would you want well again I can't even say that because I have done it myself, but <laughs> my question was gonna be why would you want to emulate something that is stupid? That hence disastrously, but then I thought, well, sin. I did it myself. We go to church, but so many just exist thinking that we'll get to heaven. Bless you, Sister Claudia. That's the truth of one of God. Very sad. And I think I already taught that the majority of Christians are not going to heaven. Not everyone is going to heaven doesn't mean that you will not have eternal life it just means not everyone is going to heaven not my opinion that's what the bible said <laughs> sir o'brien said how to experience god more this is what the lord told me he said, son, tell my people that a sincere request will always get my attention. A sincere request will always get my attention. If you sincerely want to know God, you will meet him. Never forget that. A sincere request will always get my attention. That's what he told me. Some folks want God just to escape hell. And do you know what? It doesn't work like that. Because once you believe, then belief translates love. I can honestly say that yes, my initial reason for being a Christian was so I could be saved. But now that I'm a Christian and I know God, if there was no heaven, I'd still want Jesus. I just want to find out if anyone else agree with me. If there was no heaven, I would still want Jesus. Anyone? If there was no eternal life, who would still choose Jesus? Keep it real. If there was no eternal life, who would choose Jesus? I'd love to see your hands or, or say something. And even if you don't want to answer, it's a question you need to ask yourself. And if your answer is, I wouldn't, it means you have not met him. You might have experienced him, but you don't really know him. It's like they don't want to do what comes with a godly life. To be honest, I want to tell you a secret. I'm a practical person, so I'm going to tell you the truth. Do you want to hear the truth? It's not possible to live a godly life without God. That's what makes Christianity easier for me. You want? Can I just keep it real with you guys? If you take God away from me, I'm a, I'll do some crazy stuff. If you take God away from me, take me outside of God, I'm capable of doing things that some of you guys have never dreamt about. That would give you nightmares. Because I've been exposed to the world. And I've done ungodly things before I was a Christian. So, and those ungodly thoughts or yearning doesn't go away. It's the God in you, he says, be led by the Spirit that you might not fulfill the desires of the flesh. It simply means your flesh has desires that will never go away until you die. I don't care if you're an apostle, a prophet, evangelist. I don't care if you're walking on the moon. You have desires. 
Everybody have desires. As a matter of fact, when I see men and women sitting down, just waving their hands, saying, praise the Lord, I'm just safe. Thank God you're safe, but are you telling me that you're not tempted? Because there's two things. If Jesus being God was tempted, you're telling me that you're not going to be tempted? Of course you're going to be tempted. So therefore, temptation is not the problem. It's the yielding to temptation that's the problem, right? Yes, indeed. There's no way I would turn back now. In the mighty name of Jesus, say that, O oh God, I'm the same. I'll make you shame. A nasty mess. <laughs> I tell you, man of God, say that. I tell you the truth. Why is it that when one is trying to focus on Jesus, you start having such dis so much distraction? You answered it because you're focusing on Jesus. The devil doesn't want. Remember, the most precious commodity on earth is the soul of a man, male or female. When I say a man, I mean a male or female. The devil doesn't care if you go to church. He cares if you really believe or you focus on Jesus. There's a lot of people who go to church and they don't care with you. Why is it that some Christians are so hard to say, I'm sorry, and sincerely mean it from the heart? Because our culture, I'm going to show you, that's a good question. I want to say this to you, woman of God, our man of God. Uh, sometimes when you see someone failing to say sorry, it's not because they don't want to. It's because they have been indoctrinated in thinking that sorry means weakness. And if I should be honest, if I should be honest, there was a time when I thought that sorry meant I was weak. It's, it's a long time ago now, even before Christianity, but there was a time. So I'm going to give you a quick story or a quick recap of something that happened to me when I was a young soldier in the British Army. I'd been in my regiment for maybe a year, if that. Get, got out of basic training, did my specialty training, then I went to my regiment and I was there. There was this soldier there. I'm being honest now, giving you a recap. I didn't like him. He didn't like me. I didn't like him because he was he was a bias or a racist. He didn't like people from different um, ethnicity. And I had a problem with that. He was a bit of a bully. And I had a problem with that too. And if anyone that knows me from the past know, there's a good chance I would have been in a fight with that guy. And I was looking forward to it, win, lose or draw, just being honest. So we were actually on the, a parade square with these big trucks. A lot of trucks, a lot of military and trucks and jeeps and different things. Anyway, as I was there, I had the task of go, um, putting one of the trucks in the right parking order. And as I was driving out, I was at the giveaway line, which means the vehicle that is on the main is actually as the right of, right of way. I'm hoping you understand what I'm saying. So he had the right to go, but he's so far. It's like you go to a junction and the car that is on the main road has the right but the car is so far that you can pull out and go without obstructing it, so you go. So you drive and it's safe to do so. So I pull out, I drove. Deep down, he was thinking, you should not have pulled out. And I'm thinking, well, I don't see no reason why I shouldn't. So I did. I parked the vehicle up, no obstruction. About five, ten minutes later, I was just sitting down with a few other soldiers. He came over, he's fuming. Fuming meaning he's huffing and he's puffing and he's hungry. Annoyed. He's pumped up and he's ready for a fight. And though I, my mind was not there yet, I wasn't even a Christian. I'm going to show you how God worked. But in my head, I'm going to be honest, I was like, bro, bring it. I've been waiting for a while to get even one punch. This is not me being carnal. I'm being as honest as I can be. I was like, bring it. I don't care if I lose. I just want even one good punch because you're such a bully and you're so, and you're so, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Prejudice that I'm, I'm willing to go there. And do you know he came in and he was puffing and he was huffing and he was like, you pull out on me and you do this and you do that. He's seeking an, an opportunity to start a confrontation. And in my head I was like, yeah, let's go for it. But something happened to me that has never happened before. 
he was arguing, trying to start a fight. Not an argument in terms of a fight, but a physical fist fight. Knock your teeth out. And I wanted it. My flesh wanted it, but my mouth said something that I could have beat myself. I literally heard myself say, sorry. And I was talking to myself, are you stupid? What are you doing? My mouth said it again. And I wasn't afraid. I'm telling you now I wasn't afraid. I still don't even know what happened to me. But I heard myself say, sorry. And I was annoyed at myself. My mouth was not saying what I wanted to say. My mouth was saying what God wanted it to say. But one of the most remarkable things happened. When I said sorry, though I didn't want to, I saw the strangest look on this man's face because he was expecting me to react exactly like I wanted to react. But my mouth refused to say what my brain told it to. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. And I said sorry. He didn't know what to do, so he stormed out of the of the room we were sitting in. And about 15, 20 minutes later, he came back and he stuck his hand out and he said, Simmons, I'm sorry too. He shook my hand. And what the enemy meant for bad, God took control, took control of my mouth, got rid of my ego. And against my will, I said sorry. And not only did I watch this guy's life change, he realized that he was only a prejudiced person in terms of being racist because he had no experience with people from other cultures. So then he started talking to me, started looking out for me. And then he realized that I was not as different from he was as he thought. Most times from my experience when people are afraid to say sorry, it shows fear. Now many people will never admit this, so I'm going to tell you for them. It's because of fear. They don't want to admit they're afraid, but I promise you they are. They don't want to admit that the lack of saying sorry is a fear that you might deem them to be weak. They feel like they're going to be losing something. Nine times out of ten, if you can go back and check, they would have been hurt previously. Sometimes you're paying for someone else's mistakes. So sorry is hard because of pride because of shame because of so many things so our inability to say sorry is actually a reflection of where we are mentally spiritually emotionally now i'm hoping that what i'm saying makes some sense because you know i'm going all over but what i'm saying is the truth it's actually a reflection of where we are Before I was a spiritual person, I've been in a position where I've seen guys acting the fool. And I was so angry, I was like, man, I would... And yes, I used to be that guy, I'm just going to be honest. I was like, I'd love to punch you in the mouth. No, that doesn't mean it was godly, it was very ungodly. And then as I started going in the spirit, there's people I should be angry with that I feel tears come into my eyes. <laughs> I mean, people who always fast and pray, sacrifice and always attend all night prayer. Um, should it be that we must ask the Lord to help us to have the art of forgiveness in, um, instead, of, instead of an art of stone? I tell you what the truth is, woman of God. The fact that we think, I'm going to say something now and it might be controversial, but it's the truth. I don't pray as long as most people. I've not fasted in years. And I have not been in a online prayer meeting for a long time. Someone might be thinking, let me see, the numbers are going to drop now. People are going to like, what? Well, he's not a man of God. Sincerity beats effort any day of the week. I told someone this in the prayer carriers, and anyone that has followed these instructions, they know it works. You can beat, 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 pray, 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 pray. And you will have no result. And you can come in and just accept and admit that I'm a mess. And you get results instantly. A broken and a contrite heart, he will not despise. You see, sometimes we're in a position where we're thinking. See, we're going back to parables in the Bible. And we don't know that they're not actually 
we are not subjected to some of these parables. Let me explain. For example, I don't need to be like the persistent widow. Why? Because people go in and people use the prayer of the persistent widow, not understanding that the persistent widow is for those that has no inheritance. When you're going in for a favor, it is totally different from when you're going in based on inheritance. So unfortunately, most Christians are going in and they're begging, 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 begging. Lord, do this, do this, do this. And I remember going through, and even since I've been in fire carriers and people were people who have been trying to get through some things and they can't. And the Holy Spirit said to me, tell them, it's not mine to take, it's yours to give. And the Holy Spirit says, the, whole, the, the only one that steals, kills, and destroys the devil, the Holy Spirit will never take anything from you that you have not given to him. So unfortunately, most times we are asking God to take it. And if we should just keep this real woman of God, most times people are doing this from a religious point of view. I'm not prayer meeting more actually cause you to know God no more. Oh, God Almighty, can I tell you a secret? You want to hear this? If you want to hear this, put some hearts on the screen or say yes. Let me actually tell you this. I want to tell you something. Let me tell you something and destroy the religious yoke. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Yes, indeed, sir. Bless you. I am the manifested daughter. Yes, indeed. Daughters and sons we are. If you want to hear this, let me know. I want to tell you something. All this effort we've been putting in and thinking that we're going to try and impress God. Okay, ready to go? Your efforts mean absolutely nothing to God. I have not seen one person in the New Testament that their effort got them anywhere. That's something that I don't think no one, they're not teaching. Your efforts will not get you nowhere. It means you can go in and you can fast for 50 days. And I will just yield myself for half a minute and I will get the same results you just got from 50 days fast. One million percent sure. It means, it, it's just your, it, your effort means nothing. Because if your effort is going to cause God to move, then it simply means, it simply means that your effort could have brought salvation. Don't you get it? If you're moving from a place of entitlement, then it's not a what did you do? So let me ask a question. I'm going to ask it and I'm going to answer it. The first thing you must ask yourself is, what did you do to deserve this? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. When the Lord showed me that it changed the way I pray, it changed the way I see things, what did I do to deserve this? absolutely nothing because if you know my testimony then you would have known that where i got saved is not where people get elevated is where people get degraded so my question is if i have done nothing to deserve this the question is what can i then do to sustain it absolutely nothing of your own you have nothing that you can give to god that god wants or needs The only thing accepting God is not for God, it's for you. So when you have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, heaven is not doing a sigh of relief thinking, oh my God, you just saved God by accepting him. No, you just saved yourself by accepting him. Right? So if we now can see that you did nothing to God when you chose him as your personal Lord and Savior, then you can realize that all these things that we're doing and putting so much stress on ourselves, you have people who whip themselves, people who go and fast without food for weeks and days. People have died doing it. And I thought I needed to as well. Until the Lord said to me, Son, you didn't choose me. I chose you. The question is, when you're going into a marriage, and the minister pastor says, will you take this man or this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or wife? And you say, I do. The only thing that the God of heaven is asking you to do is to say, I do. He has made a proposal 
He has sent his son to die before you were ever qualified. You're not qualified, I'm not qualified, you did nothing to deserve it, but he sent his son anyway. So therefore, we now need to eliminate ourselves from the scenario, take no credit for it, and realize that God did this because he loved us, not because we deserve it. Okay. So it means that me actually being on my best behavior would not get me any more props from God. Because my best behavior is not good enough. So what does God want from you? He's looking for someone to reflect him. If your efforts are involved, you're not reflecting God, you're reflecting yourself. Now I'm hoping someone is hearing me. If your efforts are involved, you're not reflecting God, you're reflecting yourself. So then I realized and I said, God, I don't know how to worship you because I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what I think you want. But then again, I don't know how to serve royalty. I don't know how to please a king, the king. So I might give you food that is stale. I might present you with a meal that is totally, de instead of it's being delicious or actually being appetizing to you, it's something that you find despicable, something that you detest. So the only way of pleasing God is to actually present yourself as a menu and let him do the order and let him prepare the food because if you prepare that food, you nobody going to eat it. Yo, didn't, uh, let me tell you what the scripture said. The scripture said, your righteousness, meaning my righteousness and yours, is like filthy rugs before him. I don't know if you've had a time, if you've had it explained or you've taken the time out to read the scripture for yourself, but let me tell you what it means. He says, your righteousness is like filthy rugs before him. What on earth does he mean by this? It means that your best effort, he didn't say righteousness is like filter rugs before him. He said your righteousness, it means when, when you think that you're doing your best, it is like filter rugs before God. It is nasty. It is smelly. It is unattractive. He is not interested in it because if you had something to offer, then he would not need to actually die for you. When he died for you, so what you have to offer, you could keep it to yourself. Bless you, prophet. Salute. Welcome, sir. So now that you realize that what you're offering has nothing to do with what God wants. So I used to go in, and I remember that I went through a season where I used to go in and listen to gospel music and try to activate the Holy Spirit. And then something happened. The Holy Spirit started making requests of me. He would not just allow me to listen to what I want to listen to. He would say, son, keep it at that one. So, sometimes you come in my house or come in my, the car, right, wherever, in my playlist, and I can listen to one song, one song, the whole day. And someone might be like, why do you have that one song on repeat? Because that's what the Holy Spirit wants. And I know for a fact that if I keep that song going because he's enjoying it, all things are possible. You see, if you have, your, your duty is not to give your best effort. Your duty is to make sure the Holy Spirit is comfortable. Your duty is to make sure that the Holy Spirit can flow. And if you have yielded yourself, in other words, I dare you to take the stance of saying, I am available. And then mean it. And if you tell him you're available and mean it, it will beat you praying for 10 hours. Now, this is not a guess. I know this for a fact. The things that I know, I have not been in Christianity long enough to know these things. But I remember when I met him, I said to him, I want to know you for real. And I ask questions. The reason why we have biblical questions and answers and it's open is because that's the way my mind works. I've asked him questions and he has answered. He's not offended by my curiosity. He's not offended by the things I don't understand when I ask questions. So neither am I offended. And I remember saying to him, then you say you're a God and you will never fail. And you say you never change. So why is ABC happening? Why are people dying from cancer and high blood pressure and diabetes and all these things? And he said to me, son, I didn't, I didn't change. You are changed. The world changed. 
And I said, I want to know you like Abraham, no more than Abraham. I want to know you like, like Moses. And I want to know you like the, the prophets of old and the apostles that walk with Jesus. I want to know you. I want to know the secret things. I, I know you're not offended by my questions. So help me not to be offended by questions of people. So, so oh, I had questions when I was growing up, no one could answer. Like, who made God? Am I the only one that had these questions? Where did God come from? And now he has equipped me to answer these questions that I had myself. The unfortunate thing is we think we need to do something. Bless you, Sir Spark. Salute. Bless you, man of God. So we think we need to do something to impress God. What are your views on a man or woman of God who lose their husband or wife because of spending too much time with God in prayer and fasting? They didn't spend time with God. They spent time in religion. I promise you, woman of God, there's no way that God is going to actually keep anyone in prayer and fasting. Prayer with God is a state of being. I am in prayer 24-7. So when my wife was getting used to me, she said to me, how come I don't see you withdrawing and going to pray all the time? I said, I am praying 24-7. What is prayer? Dialogue. Prayer is nothing more than dialogue between God and man. I don't pray to beg God things. People say, ask and it shall be given. That's not for me. Don't you get it? That's not for me. If you study the scriptures, then you'll realize that the new inheritance, the inheritance that I now walk in, the inheritance of the lion, the one that thunders in the heaven, the one that has eyes like a flame, the one with the sword in his mouth, the one that will spit them out for actually being lukewarm, that's the God that I walk under. You see, we're so busy studying the cross that we have missed the fact that the cross is not for us who are Christians. The cross is what made us a new creation through the blood of Jesus Christ. But now that you're a new creation, the cross is not for you. Let me explain to you what I mean. It's so now we are so obsessed with the cross that we have missed our inheritance and in walking in power and authority. So when the Lord started showing me my inheritance, he said to me, son, you're not like the apostles before the death and resurrection. You're like Jesus. And you're not just like Jesus that walked on the earth. You're like Jesus that sit in the heavenly places. Now, I know someone might think that the operation of Jesus that sits in the heavenly places now is the same operation of Jesus that walked on the earth. And I can tell you 100% no, using scriptures. The Bible said something. The Bible said because of what Jesus did. He was given a name that is above all names, but at the mention of Jesus. That means after Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, he was elevated to a higher plane. His name became the most precious name ever. Not my words. The Bible said it. So this God that says, decree a thing and it shall be established, would not tell a husband to neglect his wife or a wife to neglect her husband for 40 days while you're going out fasting, praying. Am I saying don't pray, don't misquote me? I believe in praying. I pray all the time. But prayer should be a state of being, a consciousness. I am talking to God all, all the time. It means, well, as a matter of fact, some of these fasting, sometimes people go all night prior meeting and all these things. It's more likely that you're going to hear God in an intimate way by yourself than you would have with someone else. Now, I know that if you're not used to this, you might be thinking, utter rubbish, except I'm a walking, living proof. It's not by might. That's what the world was trying to tell us. It's not by power. And when it says power, it doesn't mean the power of the Holy Spirit. It means power as in effort or ability. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by the Spirit. It means that all I power Simmons need to walk in authority and to be capable is to be yielded. 
So it doesn't take, like people say, I'm going into consecration. I'm going to go shut myself down and I'm going into consecration. Nothing wrong with it. Except the Lord tells me that what it takes for you to be consecrated is just a yielding mind. So while people would go and take two weeks to be consecrated, I yield myself and in one minute I'm consecrated. As long as your mind and your body, your soul and your spirit is yielded to God, you are consecrated because your efforts can't consecrate you. You're going back to the Old Testament. Your yieldedness consecrates you. Your availability consecrates you. So men of God and women of God, you don't need to go fast for 50 days and neglect your spouse while trying to get to know this God. As a matter of fact, this God is ever present. It's us that is not always present. This God is ever speaking. It's us that is not always speaking. And someone who does not know this principle might be criticizing right now, saying rubbish. Ask anyone that I've mentored, and I've mentored a lot of people around the world. And they have all walked in power, unless they don't want to. These principles work. And I use my phone as a demonstration. Someone said they fast for power. And they fast so their they fast so their flesh will be yielded to their spirit. And I'm like, so you mean to tell me that I need to go without food to do something that the Holy Spirit is supposed to be doing? Be led by the Spirit that I might not fulfill the desires of the flesh. All I need to do to not fulfill the desires of my flesh is to reject everything within me that is not like God. So we are busy doing efforts. See, the world is coming out of a regime of Catholicism or, cat or the Catholic Church, not being disrespectful to a certain branch, I'm just being honest. So because they're coming from that, we have, a lot of churches have moved on from it, but we have kept some of the principles. Now let me explain to you what I mean, keeping some of the principles. So by keeping some of the Catholic principles, it takes effort. Where people go and they think that they need to pay penance, beat yourself, so God will love you. Do this so you get that. Do this so you get this. It doesn't work like that. The first thing you must do to be qualified is to accept and admit that you will never be qualified. Sounds kind of contradicting, right? He will never touch you if you're proud. But if you can yield yourself and accept that I am absolutely nothing without you, then before you know it, you're qualified. How do I know it? I remember before I started functioning in such plain, someone said to me, when I became a Christian, the secret of an effective man or woman of God in any post, I want to tell you, is to be so desperate for God that you don't even see the post. <laughs> God, I call myself an apostle because he told me to call myself an apostle. I don't call myself an apostle to impress you, nor do I think it will cause me to be of a higher level if I call myself an apostle. I call myself an apostle because it's who I am. But the truth is, I was never concerned about being an apostle. You want to hear the truth? I never wanted to be no apostle. You want to hear the truth? I didn't want to be no prophet. Didn't want to be no pastor. Didn't want to be no evangelist. Didn't even want to be no usher. I was perfectly okay with sitting in and being a bench warmer. Let's call a speed a speed. Now, I don't believe in bench warmers, but that's, what, that's who I wanted to be. I was okay with just coming in and being saved. My reason for being a Christian in the first place is because I didn't want to go to hell. So I was willing to do just enough not to go to hell. That's what I wanted. So therefore, if I could just do enough just not to go to hell, then I would be okay, right? I don't want to be no prophet, be no apostle. Because I'm not, because a true prophet and a true apostle and a true pastor, these offices are not like they're being portrayed. See, prophets and apostles, they don't send others in the front line, they go on the front line first. If you read the Bible and you see that when the church is being persecuted, then the offices get persecuted before the pews. The altar, the persecution starts at the altar. It doesn't start in the pews. If you read, you'll realize 
that most of these apostles and prophets, they died from horrible deaths. A lot of them have literally lost their heads and been crucified upside down. Some of the, just check. So I am fully conscious of the life and possibilities of an apostle. I didn't want that. An apostle don't mean you get to drive the Bentley and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with driving a Bentley by the way. I'm just telling you that's not what an apostle is about. An apostle don't mean you get to heat and everyone else feed you. If you're an apostle then you feed the flocks and then you heat. That's what I know. Now, with the respect of the people, they might actually say, I'm going to serve you out of respect and reverence as my apostle. But an apostle is going to say, do you have enough food for everyone else to eat? He or she will not be asking for second service servings while someone else is hungry. He or she will not be driving a BMW when there's people without food or shelter in their congregation. I understand what it's like to be I know the offices. I know the real function of the offices. So because of that, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I didn't want to be no usher. I didn't want no spotlight. When I started functioning as an apostle, I was teaching others. I was implementing the system that God taught me and I was teaching others to go out and do this. I had absolutely no interest at all to do this. That's the mark of a prophet, of an apostle, and I'm not just saying it because I walk in it, because I know it. Those that are chasing the office lose sight of sonship and relationship. The office is not to be chased. The office is to be occupied. And I remember a prophetess came and she said to me, I was there, going in my brother's church and I was packing the benches out and I was first one in, last one out. And I remember one day they came to me, a prophetess, and she said to me, the Lord said to tell, me, tell you, he's going to use you mightily. And he said, he chose you because you don't see yourself as being worthy. And as long as you can keep that mindset that you are not doing this and you're not qualified nor worthy, that the only thing qualifying about, qualified about you is Jesus that lives in you and the only thing worthy about you is the Jesus that lives in you. If you can keep that mindset, you are absolutely A-OK. -okay. When you become a super prophet and a super apostle, then your gifts might still be in manifestation. But if you had someone to confide in, you would say, I can no longer feel my God. And I can tell you that right now. Because I remember this great king said to me, Son, do not allow the office to cause you your relationship with me. That's what he told me. Do not allow the office to cause you your relationship. Because this office will cause you your relationship. You can be so caught up in impressing the people that God will find you distasteful. Many one know this. So never lose yourself. Ministry, you can build others and destroy your family and destroy yourself if you don't know what you're doing. And that's the reason why I thank God for having sober people around me who can keep me grounded. Who will not just be yes men and yes women. One of the worst things you can have as a man of God or a woman of God is someone who is willing to tell you yes when there's nothing to say yes about. This is one of the worst situations you can find yourself in. Don't ever have anyone around you that... What's that? Don't ever keep anyone around you that is going to tell you yes when it's no. Don't ever keep anyone around you that's going to actually blow you hot here and, and actually mess your whole life up. I have a family, an extended family in the fire carriers that if, if my head is getting a bit too big, they will say, Apostle, with respect, your head is getting big. And they love me. So I know for a fact that they're telling me I need to assess myself. So there's a system in the church that the Lord told me do not apply to my life. I've seen men and women that are in trouble. They might be apostles and prophets, but they say they cannot be corrected by anyone who is not a prophet or apostle. And the Holy Spirit said to me, son, make yourself available to be corrected by anyone that carries the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately, when God shows you something about me or show me something about you, it's not 
It's not I that is saying it. It's not you that is saying it. But you're speaking based on what the Spirit of God is showing you. So my God Almighty, you're telling me that I am there playing the fool. There's no prophet around. There's no apostle around. There's no one there that is in a so-called office that can correct me. And I'm going to go to hell because only someone who is an, in the same office or above that can correct me. The Holy Spirit tell, told me, he said, son, make yourself available to be corrected by anyone that is possessed by my spirit. It means you could be five years old or 55 years old. As long as I hear my God speaking in you, I will shut my mouth and I will listen. Because ultimately, it's not about the office. The office is not for you. Let me tell you what he told me. He said, son, the office is not for you. The office is for the kingdom. The office is not for you. The office is for the kingdom. What do I mean? God didn't make you a prophet so you could be a prophet for yourself. It's so you could enhance the kingdom. Did not make you an apostle so you can go out and prove what a big apostle you are? It is to enhance the kingdom. So if the office is not for you, then what do you do to preserve yourself? Let me tell you what's for you. Sonship is for you. Relationship is for you. So you can't let the office that is for the kingdom cost you your sonship. Because the office cannot save you, but your sonship can save you. Your office will never, as a matter of fact, write this down if you get a chance, your sonship will sustain your office. And your office will never sustain your sonship. It means being an apostle does not give you an automatic right to heaven, to eternal life. Being a prophet does not give you an automatic right of holiness. Maintaining your sonship will preserve your office. Because God is not there to communicate with the office. He's there to communicate with the son who is in an office. He's there to communicate with the daughter that is in an office. And when you understand this, it changes absolutely everything. Someone can type across the screen, in my office will not cost me my relationship. My office will not cost me my relationship. That's what my God told me. And I was like, I don't want to just be here doing this for the sake of doing this. My office will not cost me my relationship. I refuse. I would rather, you want to hear this? To be just a regular member sitting in the church than to be an apostle going to hell. Relationship trumps gift any day of the week. How do I know it? I've proven many times. Because your gifts will give you operation, but your gifts will never give you authority. Only relationships give you, only your relationship with God give you and give you authority with God. There you go. My office will not cost me my relationship. Don't let it cost you your relationship. Never. And that's what have happened to a lot of people. A lot of brilliant men and women of God. They are born and called and powerful and gifted. And then in a few years, they're like a byword. And people are like, oh, he was fake all along. No, he wasn't. No, she wasn't. A lot of these people started off in an authentic way. And they ended up almost like a pillar of salt, like, like lots of life. My office will not cost me. My relationship with God. I would rather to give up being an apostle and maintain my sonship. Because being an apostle will not give me eternal life. Being an apostle only give me, it give me governmental operation within the spirit. It doesn't give me access to eternity. And I think someone need to teach this. Your office will never cause you to see eternity. It will never cause you to see eternity. Only your relationship will. And when we get this, if we can get that right, all things else will fall in line. It is sad. Paul said, let's 
I preach others in and I myself be a cast out which tells you that you're, 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 you, you might be effective in your office and, in, and, and, and not effective as a son. So now that you've been given a job in the family, the family's business, i.e. ministry, don't let the minute, don't let the family business cost you your relationship with your father. Eh? We do it all the time. I go in and I'm like, mm, I gotta keep God, and you can keep whatever else. Very, very important. Very important. I have been there, I have seen it, and I made my own mind up. This won't be me. I won't do this. I will make sure that... All right, so I have this principle that I, 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 I said. I said, I am a no matter what Christian. But I know that for me, I can't actually... Um, I can't actually... Um, how would I put it? I can't actually express this of my own. When I say I'm a no matter what Christian, let me tell you what I mean. It means that my mind is fully made up that irrespective of what comes my way, I will not give up no matter what. I will continue to live no matter what. I will continue to give glory no matter what. I'm a no matter what Christian. But for you to achieve such an announcement, you must be fully grounded and be led by the Spirit. Because you can say no matter what. But I found myself in some situation where the enemy is like, this ain't working out for you. And I just start, I burst out in laughter like a crazy man. And I'm there laughing and I'm thinking to myself, what's the alternative to Jesus? If I choose not to be a Christian right now, what, what else will I choose? Who feels comfortable in the dark after, after um, having been in the light? Who goes back to eating grass when you've had steak? So if it's not Jesus, then what will it be? Because I'm there and I'm like, okay, devil, I see what your plans are. Except some of us have no backup plan. Jesus is my first plan, my second plan, my third plan. I have no backup plan. There is no reserve shoot. He is that backup shoot, reserve shoot. He is my fail safe. There is no juju, there is no witchcraft, there is no... I have no inheritance outside of God to fall back on. So if I don't, if it's not God, then what is it? So I'm like, okay, so I see what you're doing. You're trying to frustrate me so I can look to the left or to the right. Except, I've already experienced the glory of God. What am I going to, what is the left going to offer me? Because anything that I'm going to do, now, I will never, but I'm going to give you the scenario. If you believe in the law of progression, then obviously you're not going to be heading backwards. True? Because you believe in the law of progression. So why would you leave the most high God and go to anything else? Because that's the highest peak you can get to. That's what I know. That's what I believe. So if Jesus is the highest peak you can get to, what are you going to do? after leaving Jesus who are you going to turn to after leaving Jesus because there, it doesn't get no better than that and if it doesn't get no better than Jesus then what are you going to do you might as well buckle, buckle yourself down and get to know him better because in truth and fact there is absolutely nothing that you can do or I can do because he is the eye spinnaker He is the highest pinnacle. Outside of him, everything else pales compared to him, right? So therefore, I'm just asking the question, what else am I going to do? So yes, I might feel down, and yes, I might feel like I need to be motivated, but giving up on God is not an option. Who am I going to choose? I'm going to choose myself. Well, I know for a fact that I'm not capable. I'm certainly not going to choose you. Nor am I going to choose anything negromancy, nothing of the devil, because we're just taking backward steps. When a man or a woman gives up on God, my question is, what did he use to replace him? Because everything is a mess. <laughs> it's almost like you gave up a Range Rover and you got yourself one of those uh, 
one of those tricycles or a bike not even an engine bike a motorcycle i mean like a, a pedal bike as a matter of fact that's being kind what could you use as a substitute who could represent the majesty he represents who is as awesome as he is awesome who has the power that he has who else can bring deliverance not just in this life but in the life to come who else grants access to eternity who else is the only way to the father so my question is is it the name of Jesus beautiful <laughs> there you go we have got like a skateboard and we're still being kind it's like a turtle flipped upside down going nowhere trying to trying to flip off its shell to get on get on its legs get it I choose Jesus outside of him there is absolutely nothing else I'm gonna close because the time is far spent but don't just seek spirituality seek Jesus I'm asking my God that he will touch everyone that is here because many of us are here right now we could have been out this Friday night you could have been out having fun doing some ungodly stuff, but you chose to actually come in and listen to a word of God, to join in and to give our God the glory and the praise he deserves. So I salute you all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. I stand in agreement with you as we give our God the glory and the praise he deserves. I want to encourage someone that have not yet made Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior is to, guess what? I, I, I have a method I want to say to you quickly. When I met God, I did not have for Jesus. I call upon the one true God. And this is something that I have said multiple times and I'm saying it now. I dare you to call upon the one true God. Don't, don't call upon no Buddha, no Muhammad, no... And, 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 and if you think Jesus is not the one true God, just call upon the one true God from a sincere place and then you come, get my email, get my contact here on Facebook and tell me who showed up. Tell me who answered. Because Jesus, my God... The one that taught us told me, he said, son, when you call upon the one true God from a sincere place, nothing else or no one else will answer you but the one true God, Jesus Christ. Buddha would not dare to answer when the one true God has been called from a sincere place. Muhammad wouldn't, Kushna wouldn't, um, Selassie wouldn't, and every other God that is outside of Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah, they wouldn't dare. So I dare you to call upon the one true God from a sincere place and then tell me what happens. I dare you to, uh, to, to, to go out there and put yourself out there and say, my God, I might not know you because I didn't know him either. But if you're real, and I didn't, and I say the word if because that's the way I said it too. I said, if you are real, I want to know you. And God Almighty, he visited me. Bless you, woman of God. Thank you. So just ask him. Go in. Don't be afraid to represent him. I'm asking him. I'm asking my God to visit some of you guys like he has visited me. I'm asking my God that some of your relationships will be enhanced with him. That you guys will go in and you will not be led by your own understanding, but you will trust the one true God. Who is the one true God? I can act, actually say to you confidently that the one true God is Jesus Christ. But just in case you don't believe me, I'm not offended. I dare you to call upon the one true God from a sincere place and then come back and tell me who showed up. The angels are there with flaming swords. Muhammad would never turn up. Buddha would never turn up. The one true God will turn up. The risen Messiah. The Jewish God. Trust me. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the only way to God. I'm excited to represent him. Do you know what it's like to go from a nobody to commanding cancer to go and it must listen? To command diseases to go to speak to demons and watch them, they watch the, just the words of your mouth 
tormenting them where they are afraid of you and they squirm and they go where they don't even want to share the same atmosphere with you because the fire in your body that is from God is too much for them to bear who can tell me this God is not real bless you man of God I salute you all so family I salute you all God bless you enjoy the rest of your night I pray for you and I cover you in the name of Jesus I cover your family cover you in you going in and you going out and may we continue to give our God the one true God the glory and the praise he deserves in the matchless name of Jesus Christ bless you family and don't forget to share so someone else can catch this this uh, the rebroadcast um, you know it's just a privilege and a pleasure I love God I love Jesus Christ he is my personal Lord and Savior and I would not give him up for absolutely anything. Amen. Bless you, woman of God. It's good to have you. Family, salute. God bless you. Catch you on the next one.